you can try to get little essence of, but you can't duplicate the feeling that you have when you go to an HBCU football game. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of The Rundown with Reggie Chapman. I am your host, Reggie Chapman, and today I'm very, very happy to be joined by really a trailblazer in the sport of college sports. Uh, Tiffany Green, you are the first black woman to do play-by-play -play at the biggest sports network on the planet. Uh, thank, you just for, thank you for just giving me like a couple of minutes of your time. I mean, this is insane. Uh, we're obviously here for the uh, MEAC Swag Challenge, and uh, welcome back to Atlanta. Oh, thank you. I love being in Atlanta. It's a, it's a wonderful place, and it should be kind of deemed a new chocolate city, in my opinion. Well, can I say that? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we're gonna let it, I'm going to let it slide. It is. It, <laughs> it is. really is, I though. Mean, if you spend any time here, you recognize it. I was at Toast on it. Linux, and it was just like, wow, you go in, and like everywhere you go, it's like that. It's incredible. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm curious for you, as, as somebody that works at... And we'll, we'll get to your story and everything in a second, mm -hmm. but just Atlanta in general, right? This yeah. is a location for a place that they do the kickoff game every year. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the Celebration Bowl this year. Yeah. Even the uh, um, SWAC baseball championships are over there at Georgia That's Tech. Right. How important is the city of Atlanta for HBCU athletics? Well, I feel like it has become its own kind of mecca for black sports as more um, conferences are deciding like, hey, this is the place to be. I mean, we see it on a, a power four or a group of five level in terms of the interest and the way that it can entertain. And ever since the 96 Olympics, it has grown into that uh, more and more. I think the basketball tournament for the SWAC was just announced as well that they will be coming here to Atlanta. And it's a desirable destination. Like everybody's trying to get to the A, like no doubt. Just like I live in Florida. And so people flock to Orlando because of the destination and the theme parks and Disney World. Well, Atlanta is very much that in the sense for sports and culture and entertainment. It's just a well-rounded city. It's cool, too, because FAMU is obviously behind us getting warmed up for the game. You could see when they rolled in here, their phones are out. I mean, they recognize we're here at Turner Field. Field right. You know what I'm saying? We had some players over there standing there pretending they were playing baseball. I mean, they're obviously very excited. But when you get the chance to come back to Atlanta, is it exciting for you as well? It is. It's a place where I remember coming as a kid, and we would go to, you know, the King Center, or we would just go around and, and soak up all of the history, go to the AUC and just understand what HBCU culture was like outside of our time at Florida A&M. And then you add the component of family. Uh, many of my family members live here. So it's just, um, it is is a very familiar place and it's one where you can always find something new to do, whether it's you're taking in, you know, the aquarium or you're going to the trap museum, like it, it just offers you so much that um, you can never get tired of coming back to Atlanta. Well, you're not new to, like you said, your family's out here, but you're not new to like even working uh, in the state of Georgia. You still, we used to work in Savannah. That's right. That's what was right. That like, I mean, hey, <laughs> I was with WJCL and WTOC during my three and a half years there, and that's where I really cut my teeth in the mm -hmm. business. That was my first on-air opportunity as a uh, MMJ is what they call it now, but a one-man band is what we called it back in the day, and I mean like thugging it out, okay? Right. Like this heat and greater, walking in heels, lugging around heavier cam camera equipment than there is now, trying yep. to turn stories. Like, all of those bring back such wonderful memories because it was the foundation. And it showed me um, just how hard you have to work in, in order to stand out. You've got to do more. You've got to be better in any way that you can. Um, so it was just a wonderful foundational piece for me and a building block. And I will forever be grateful for my time in the state of Georgia uh, and Savannah and, and what it just did for my career because that's that was the launching point. We're going to get to take a second to talk about FAMU in a second because I know how much it means to you and your entire family. <laughs> yes. Um, but to go from FAMU to Savannah, and um, I read that you did almost every other job under the sun as you tried to work your way up to here um, to be the first black woman to ever do college football um, in the booth. Uh, was this always the goal or especially since there was nobody that had ever done it before was this always what you were shooting for or did it just end up this way right no it was something that I was always gunning for and I was the one egg one basket kind of person so I put all of my energy into it I saw it in my household I learned about it because my father 
was a trailblazer in the Tampa Bay area. And so while I didn't get to see him on television, I learned of his radio career and was much more involved in that. And he always pushed me. My mom was a great encourager as well. So I was the kid who wrote down in my um, kindergarten year, but hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? Sportscaster. And whatever I had to do to get there, I wanted to be a part. And I tried to be in, this, in, in terms of the field of play. Like I wanted to play basketball. I was always in the backyard, you know, playing football with myself, <laughs> throwing up the football. And then yeah. I went to the Boys and Girls Club and did throw up tackle. So I was, I was always in the sports in one way or another. And once I realized that, hey, look, I don't have a future in I this. I feel like that's, right? I was gonna, that's, that's everybody that's ever done yeah. that. I feel like me and yeah. really every other sportscaster were just all washed up athletes that just didn't make it. Exactly. Like, <laughs> so we didn't make it, but I still wanted to remain connected Correct. to sports in some form or fashion yeah. and to be able to still be a part of the game, getting up for it, preparing for it, no different than you're going on the field uh, or on the court. Like, that's such a satisfying feeling. So that gives me, like, great joy every time that I get to call a game because it's like... Oh dang! Like I'm putting in the same work and preparation in different forms um, as the athlete, and, and it helps to satisfy that athlete's mentality, that competitive edge um, that I think we all have. So the the news background really helped me. And I was talking with someone yesterday that news really helped me to become a better storyteller. Yeah. Right. And connect the dots, and you just transfer it over to whatever the topic is. And in this instance sports so when i moved to orlando i kind of was this feature type of reporter and then they started a 24-hour sports network and i was able to transition over there and it was that time where i then got a uh, an opportunity to do more and it was like okay sideline reporting for our high school football games yeah. or you know doing play-by-play i had only tried my hand at that in college for softball or the pa announcer for basketball so to be able to do it uh throughout an entire broadcast was something special. And I think that was, to me, the turning point in my career because it allowed me an opportunity. How many times do you get reps right. and a chance to be able to call games and yeah. stuff like that? You don't. So when people are trying to break into the business, that's the hard part. Where do you go to get those opportunities? I was really blessed to be able to have that. And so, boom, from there you get recognition and people are starting to see you. And it is unique. And I recognize, too, I was like, okay, well, there aren't a lot of women right and more specifically black women correct in the play-by-play -play chair so let me see if I can carve out my own niche because there were a lot of women that I knew that were doing sideline reporting and that's how I got introduced to ESPN but I wanted to go beyond that and right. challenge myself and I used to sit and listen to Steve Stone and Harry Carey Pat Summerall and John Madden you know Marv Albert all throughout and Robin Roberts was like the one person that I could point to and say, oh my gosh, I want to do that and I want to be that because outside of her sports center anchor job, she did college basketball play by play um, right. for the women's game. So I wanted to, to kind of chart my own course and, and do something very similar to what she did because I admire her so much. When you got to this point, did you recognize, like at what point it kind of hit you like, yeah. I did it, I'm the, I'm the first, or is that something that you should or like, I, where does it kind of hit you? Well, it wasn't until actually like a day or two before the game or just leading up to um, Alabama State who hosted all Corn State. And that was back in October of, I want to say, 2017, 18. Mm -hmm. I always like mix up that year because right, right, I'm right. like, <laughs> I really wasn't seeking this. That's not what I was searching for. And people kept making mention of it. And then our ESPN PR department said, hey, I think you are the first black woman to call college football on a major network. Like from a play-by-play -play seat. That's a big deal. Massive. Uh, <laughs> but you try not to take that on too much because then it becomes greater pressure, mm -hmm. right? And this, you know, we're already in a, a pressure cooker type of um, job where you've got to be able to perform. Yeah. Putting that in the back of your mind um, only creates more anxiety, I feel. Um, and it was definitely that. I had to like loose off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many times <laughs> and try to dance and just loosen myself up because I understood the magnitude of that moment and also the wonderful responsibility that I was gifted. So I didn't want to screw it up so that I can create the pathway for others to come through. Like I you know, was able to open the door and like, boom, I'm trying to bust it open wide so that so many more flood through that look like me uh, and look like me and you. 
Um, so it, 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 was, it, was, it was a lot and I had to process it and it took time and more people bring it to your attention and so you're like, whoa, okay, um, yeah, this, this was a thing, um, but I'm grateful for that thing. What do you think it is about you and how you do games that maybe maybe separates you? Other than the fact that, like you said, there's nobody else like you that does it. But right. Where did you kind of find in the work that you're going to find a way to separate yourself to help you get the point? Yeah, and I feel like I've tried to pull from different people because, you know, when you first start out in the business, you try to emulate or copy people because you like their style, their tone, their style, their delivery. And I feel like I did a lot of that and pulled from a number um, of broadcasters. Stuart Scott was among them, right? Mm -hmm. Because he was the first to come on the scene to be culturally relevant and drop those gems within highlights. That was me. That's, yeah. that's how I got All it. That, it was, right? Stuart Scott so, yeah. so it was beautiful to see because we had never seen it done before. And right. quite honestly, I don't know that we will see it as masterfully done because he was the first to do it. Um, and I love the excitement of August Johnson, but also, like I said, Harry Carey, even though he was in an analyst role, he was very much himself. He endeared and was, was loved by Cubs fan and baseball fans all together. So I love that he was just him. John Madden kind of follows that same suit. Marv Albert, I mean, his yeah. voice, his calls, and they were so punchy. And it was simplicity of words, yes! And that was it. That's all he had to do. And it was just like, oh, you know what time it is. So um, I feel like I brought a, a mixture of a little bit of all of that, plus myself. I, I, I like to think I'm up on music and, and current culture and what's, what's popping and how I talk in, in my household or with yeah. my friends. Um, I wanted to bring that to, to the stage because everybody is already doing a lot of the same thing. So if I just go out there and I'm myself, and, I, and that took time to grow into the comfortability of like introducing that to everybody yeah. and being comfortable with that. But like, you know, I, I feel like now, <laughs> as, as I've heard, um, you know, got a little, got a little, little, little swag to the, to, to the sauce and I, I feel good about what I'm doing. And now players say, oh man, I love when you do that. Yeah. Oh, I love this call in the game, and they'll go back and play it on their phone. And I'm like, oh, shoot. So, like, now I got to pop out and show out here right. in Atlanta <laughs> this weekend. Has there been a moment where you were like, I've, I've, I've made it? Uh, or like a moment where you were, I don't know, I don't want to say starstruck, because you know what I mean? Or is there, has there been right. that moment for you where you're like, hmm, okay, I, I'm kind of on that level now where people can see me? Right. Um, so I try really hard, like my mom is huge in trying to humble me <laughs> and make sure that I remain that way. I don't think I am, I get ahead of myself too much and I don't take myself too seriously. Um, I just like to have a good time yeah. and be that cool person who you can count on and you know it's gonna be professional. But I will say there have been moments, but one most recently was invited to the um, office of the vice president, her house, her residence. And um, it was a Women's Sports Foundation event. Billie Jean King was the founder of the foundation. And I gotta tell you that I was in a room of heavy hitters, women in sports who have done tremendous things and are continuing to do that. And I walked around there and I was like, yeah, I feel good. Wow. Like, I, I feel like I'm comfortable, I'm me, and I belong here. You know, because sometimes there is that, that doubt that creeps in or that, that small voice is like, you're not good enough or, you know, you're not supposed to be here. It's like, no, nah. like I, I can tell you that I have had a number of people who have reaffirmed me, um, spoken life into me so that when I got there, it was just like, God told me, yeah, you're supposed to be here. And, and that alone was just so satisfying right because wow. we're in a we are in a subjective business we yeah. are in a business where because we're front-facing a lot of people have a lot to say about us and sometimes Correct. those comments and thoughts kind of start to fester in our mind and I'm not trying to sit here and, and kind of provide a therapy session but it's it's an honest and real thing yeah. and Especially now with social media, they social media there's so, so easily much. Now. There's so much out yeah. there that, you know, you, you've got to protect your peace and you've got to, you know, continue to rewind the thoughts and remind yourself of the 
good things that you have done and the value that you add to where you are and and remind yourself like yo I'm good enough and I'm supposed to be here and I've worked hard to be here I have paid my dues right I am very proud of my journey I am so proud of it some people can go straight from one place to the next and boom they're they're on the national scene and they're stars that was not my story yeah all right I started in local news and I and I and I you know got it in the mud if you will mm -hmm. for about 10 years before I made it to my dream destination of ESPN and I wouldn't take anything from my journey wild how many people, people can say, say that right, right? Yeah. <laughs> wow because it makes it all the more satisfying yeah, exactly. right like you know chop wood carry water you hear it all the time and at some point you have to fall in love with the process of of you know trying to hone your skills and be better at your craft and stand out and be satisfied in what you do because you know once you've given your absolute best nobody can take that from you and where that ranks in the eyes of other people is on them that's not on me. I've done my job if I've done my best. So I got to ask one more question on just that. Uh, what was it like being the vice president? Oh, it was great. Okay, so that's, that's crazy. wait, 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 time out. I feel like we just passed that. <laughs> you, you, of course, the rest was like, you didn't be the so, vice president. I did. But here, here's the coolest part. So let me tell you the beauty of HBCUs and our connections, right? The vice president and I share a sisterhood in Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority mm -hmm. Incorporated. We share um, our educational background post-secondary at an HBCU. And it was because I feel like of some of those things that pulled her um, to be able to come to the Celebration Bowl. So I met her for the first time here in Atlanta for the Celebration Bowl. There you go. And working with her office, we got her on air and we talked to that. her just about what her experience was like at Howard University, what it was like um, to be an AKA, what it was like to uh, hold the second highest office in the land. So, it, but, but she was so real and cool, it felt like familiar. Yeah. It felt like kinfolk. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that was, that was like one of those career defining moments because we fought really hard to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And people don't see those things behind the scenes, but um, it, that, was, that was so cool. So when I saw her in her residence, yeah. one of the first things I said to her as we're about to take a picture, so uh, sorry my rattlers had to beat up on your mice. <laughs> 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 she said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did you forget uh, where you were and whose house you were in? Right, right. But like, I could say that to right. a person who may potentially be the president of the United States. Like that's a moment that I feel like I'll forever cherish because it was it was all based on the foundation that I received at an HBCU to, to kind of have that familiarity. Um, and we laughed about it and we kind of joked back and forth with it a little bit more, but that, that was just one of those, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. That's insane. Yeah. That's an incredible story. <laughs> uh, Let's talk about FAMU for a second. Yeah. I mean, it's very clear how much it needs to your family. I think mm -hmm. your great, or was it a great, great grandmother, great grandmother great back grandmother. in the early 1900s? Yep, was 1908. There. Did you even have a choice of being able to go to FAMU? Or really? Not? No. Okay. okay. Well, there like, you go. like real talk. <laughs> no. Okay. And I and I tried to be the rebel. I'm the youngest child mm -hmm. of two, and I was just like, oh no, I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna go there. And my parents were like, well, if you get a scholarship, great. But let me tell you. My child and my money are going to FAMU if we have anything to do with it. And, uh, well, you see where I ended up. And it was the best decision that I could have ever made because most people don't quite understand. Everyone has allegiances to their universities and where they went to school. But people don't quite grasp kind of the um, insane love that FAMUans have for our university. It's something in the water, I don't know, but it's an infectious spirit. It gets down in your bones. It was implanted in me from when I was a little girl. So we were going to Florida Classics. We were coming here yeah. for the Atlanta Classic um, back in the day. It's, it's always been a part. Uh, and it was also a way to bring people together, right? Our family, our friends, like everybody would gather around it, much like you do for, you know, a Thanksgiving Day meal. Right. Uh, we were always together and celebrating. And there were so many wonderful accomplishments and people who, you know, walked the campus and have gone on to be really successful that it was, and it was everyday people. Mm. 
everyday people you know it's not always the stars but it's the people who impact you day to day and I saw that with FAMU um, so it was like why wouldn't I want to be a part of that it was it, it's the College of Love and Charity and that excellence uh, that they provide with caring is, is top notch it's not like anything else I've ever experienced no knock to anybody right. else but I mean it's the song of the summer it's the song of you know the year thus far you know they not like us they not you, you got, got to go, go back, back and speak, speak in 2022, right? Uh, yes. Right? What oh, was that like? Now, that right there was like career accomplishment, there. check off the yeah. list, you know. Mm -hmm. I can't begin to, it was like a seminal moment. Like, I can't begin to tell you how much that meant because I remember having to go, right. having to go mm -hmm. with my family, <laughs> you know, during homecomings when my sister was there, even prior to that, my dad's from Tallahassee. So, being able to then go as a student, it was just like, all right, well, you know, check it off. Right. You know, get credit for class, like, eh. But you <laughs> saw who was coming back, and you appreciated the knowledge that they dropped and that they cared to come back and, um, you know, give us their insights and um, words of wisdom. So to stand up there and to do that, and my husband introduced me, and that's where we met at FAMU, and it was just like, it was like the perfect storm. I'm not saying that it was like my wedding day, right? <laughs> right. Can't say that. You can't say that. Can't say that. But, but <laughs> I mean, it's like right up there with it because I got to experience it with my husband and yeah. my family was there. And so, and then my collective family was there. It was just one, one of the best moments I feel like of, of my career. Last couple questions. I want to talk about just HBCU football in general. Mm -hmm. uh, Pam, you, you make that move over to the SWAC. Mm -hmm. Win the Celebration Bowl this last year over yeah. Howard, which is pretty cool. Um, it feels like, obviously, HBCU athletics and HBCU football has been growing over the last couple of years. Um, it's always been growing, but then, of course, you get Deion Sanders coming in here, and then, of course, the stage that they have with the Celebration Bowl here and um, everything else. It's just, how, do you, how have you seen... Um, how people perceive HBCU sports, HBCU football mm -hmm. over the last five, ten years, and where do you kind of see it going? Well, they're hungry, and they want more, and that's the beauty. And I think that's one of the things that Coach Prime did during his time was, yes, there was a greater attention and platform um, that more people, uh, an audience that didn't necessarily uh, tune in before, got a chance to be introduced to, and it's just like, oh, man, this is really good football. Yeah. And, and then in addition to that, the awesome traditions, the, the, the legacy, the, uh, the kind of pomp and circumstance, if you will, nothing like it. That, that is of the pageantry, I guess is the better word for it, that you have with HBCUs, you can't replicate that anywhere. I mean, you can, you can try to, you know, reappropriate, you can try to get little essence of, but you can't duplicate the feeling that you have when you go to an HBCU football game with the band, with the cheerleaders, with the alumni. Um, it's just one of those, you hear it said so often that it kind of dulls it down, but the family reunion kind of feel or element, everyone is coming together. Um, so I, I feel like more people are attuned to it now and are enjoying it. And I think it's gonna continue quite honestly because uh, the conversation is still there around it. Like, hey, there were no players that were drafted from HBCUs right. last year. That's a problem because right. when you look at what Isaiah Land is doing or Marquise Bell is doing, um, and they come from FAMU, I'm using them sp specifically, um, but James Houston out of Jackson State, Isaiah Bolden, like their success. And Tariq Cohen was one of the kind of new age players who ushered in this portion of HBCU football in the modern era and when he was the human joystick on the field he was so much fun to watch but it transferred over into the NFL so I think it's only going to continue to grow because the appetite is there and it, it's 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 been wet and you've got to satisfy it mm -hmm. you know and you've got to continue to give it more and you know sometimes the best number is more right. uh, so as you continue to see more exposure for HBCUs and um, more interest. And I think NIL and all those things and Portal obviously play a factor. You get to see more 
of your favorite players right. um, and, and follow their journeys. I think the, the essence of more will continue to be there because the product has been there. My last question is where do you kind of fit into all of that? Your role mm -hmm. in helping HBCU football take the next level. Yeah. And do you feel some of that pressure or do you enjoy having that role of knowing that you get the chance to help bring this incredible mm -hmm. version of the sport yeah. to a different strategy? I welcome it. Yeah. I want that. You know, at ESPN, one of the things that I have told my boss is that this is something that I take ownership of. Like, it is close to me. It is near and dear to me. So I want to take care of it and do the absolute best job that I can. I'm working behind the scenes to try to get more, along with others who are championing the causes of HBCUs. And I feel like I'm an ambassador. Yeah. Um, for HBCUs and, and HBCU sports, I think, you know, Jay Walker and I created Black College Live to try to bring kind of the essence and elements of HBCU um, life to the screen uh, on, a, on a college football weekend. Not much different than what you see from college game day. And we are working and it's a passion project. You know, we're still working to bring support, but this is an out of pocket uh, labor of love in addition to those uh, sponsors who have been dedicated uh, to helping us along the way to make sure that we tell our story and we highlight the wonderful things that are happening and not just kind of you know check a box or pocket it yeah. in and package it in one particular form but there is so much wonderful um, um, just spirit love excellence that we're a part of that we have the opportunity to showcase. So every time that we're on a broadcast, we're trying to make sure that you know more than just about the football players and the teams. We right. want you to know about the players and, and what their aspirations are and, and what type of leaders they're gonna be for the future. We want you to know, you know, the alumni who have made a difference and are, are, are people of recognition, but also who, who have their little spec all, all along, um, along this line of, of, of impact and, and, and great things that have happened in our country so and, and within the world. So I feel like I'm a part of that and it's my job to help tell the story and highlight the things that are being done and have been done and will continue to be done um, and, and remind us that you know it's, it's, it's a fight. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a fight but I think that there are a lot more people who are joining the fight to share the stories of HBCUs, to hire HBCU students, to see the, the true value in it. Um, as it's, again, it's, it's been there. Yeah. It's been there, it's just like, all right, just come on, welcome more to the party. Welcome more to the party. Have, have a good time. We hope you have a good time. <laughs> What a mic drop. <laughs> Just incredible. Uh, well, uh, I think that's it for me. Um, you've answered all my questions. So naturally, I'm going to finish with the journalism question that I'm sure we have all learned. Have you ever watched any journalism? Yes. Is, Is there, there anything, anything else I didn't ask you <laughs> <laughs> that I thought I might ask you or anything else you wanted to say before we get going? Um, no, I think you've done a very thorough job. And I just thank you for um, taking an interest because how do you advance the story? How do you tell the story? How do you... Um, hip others to what's going on. It's these type of moments right here. So I'm very appreciative of that from you. Well, I'm just thankful that you answered my DM on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, and, it's really that simple. <laughs> Thank you for answering my yeah, DM. Yeah. You got it, you got it, Reggie. Appreciate I appreciate it. you.